Oh, hi there. You must be here for, uh, you're probably not here for that, are you? You're probably here for the Kickstarter announcement. I apologize. I'm not quite ready. If you don't mind giving me a second, I'll change into something a little bit more classy. Too much? This is too much, isn't it? Hang on, just a second. See, isn't this better? Much more comfortable. But we're not here to talk about fashion. We're here to talk about birthrights. So let's dive in. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch that short intro. Hope you found it a little bit humorous and it brightened up your day just a little bit. I am super excited to announce the launch of my book, Birthrights, into the form of audiobook. It has been a dream of mine for many years to have my works turned into an audiobook. As an avid audiobook listener, consuming such works as The Wheel of Time, uh, Brandon Sanderson's Stormlight series and Mistborn series, Kings of the Wild, Lies of Locke Lamora, Rage of Dragons, Robin Hobbs' Farseer trilogy, and oh so many more, I cannot wait to add my book to the shelves of the audiobook world. Not only am I adding it into the shelves of the audiobook world, but I'm adding it with a powerhouse voice of Henry Kramer, son of acclaimed narrators Michael Kramer and Kate Redding. He brings such a depth to the characters in my story, breathing life into the words and really making the images come off the page. I cannot wait for you to enjoy the work. So as a treat to you all, please enjoy the prologue to Birthrights. Prologue, the final night. Wailing cries of dying men, mixed with the harrowing howls of dark beasts, filled the cold night air, bitter and unforgiving. Harsh wind shook the tall pines of the forest, casting drifts of snow onto the thick black hair of a lone warrior. He was tired, so tired. However, the acidic hatred and determination boiling within his veins urged him forward. Slowly, the warrior, Denethurius, climbed the ruined mountainside, using the broken trees to support his battered body as he pressed forward. A crimson crescent moon loomed in the night sky, dimly lighting the man's steep path. Blood stained the ground behind him as he limped onward, dripping from the chainmail-covered animal hide that wrapped about his body. That seemed trivial to him, the loss of his lifeblood, compared to what he had faced. Wounds heal, death is eternal. The battered warrior ran a calloused thumb over an untarnished ring of silver, roughly hewn and embellished with a single paw print of a bear. The thick ring harnessed an unnatural light about it, faint and fading, but still present. The moonlight could no longer aid him, for he had already drawn upon her light far too long during this bloody night. He trudged forward, climbing slowly upward, and with every step, searing pain emanated from the wound on his side, which did not seem to heal as others had in the past, and his golden eyes slowly dimmed. Ahead, at the peak of the Twin Mountains, past where the trees could grow, two figures could be seen talking. One was a tall Morian male, the high priest of their dark cult. He had a naturally white flesh and long, pronounced features. His head was shaved, save only a single black braid of hair that hung off the back of his scalp. This was covered by a helmet formed from the skull and horns of some dark beast spawned by his master. Red tattoos veiled the man's lean but muscular body, running like rivers of blood over his face, torso, and extremities. Die by hell. A mix of disgust and rage formed in his bosom at the appearance of his foe. The other was a woman in a long black dress of tourish design. It was slim and sleek, flowing majestically over her slender features. A three-pronged crown of icy steel sat nobly upon fiery hair of crimson. Her flesh, too, shone bright white in the moonlight, enhanced by an otherworldly sheen. The warrior had never actually seen Miria before this moment, but he knew exactly who she was. The Blood Queen as she was known among the tribes of men, practiced the darkest form of magic, blood magic. She was at one time the most powerful sorceress the land of Ethria had ever known. 
but now, at the end of this great desolation, this last and terrible war, the Dark Queen was depleted. Seemingly abandoned by her corrupting gods, the Fallen Ones, dark deities who lent her demonic abilities, Myria was but an empty hull, abandoned by all but her most loyal servant. Queen Myria was the first to see the bleeding warrior making his way slowly up the mountain pass towards them. She quickly turned towards her high priest, Daibahe, muttering something to him. A gaze that could pierce the night was the last thing the warrior saw from Myria before she hurried out of sight. The tattooed man took up a crude stone hammer from the earth and rushed furiously towards the warrior. The two clashed, and the wounded man fought with all his might against his colossal enemy. Hot blood spewed across the snow as blows were traded in a ferocious duel. Despite Dibahale's towering size, the warrior's scales gained him the upper hand. The warrior forced the hammer from Dibahale's icy fingers. He then knocked the tattooed man to the earth with a powerful blow from the haft of the stone hammer. Still breathing, the warrior thought to himself, noting Dibahale's heaving, bony chest. Morians were such unnatural creatures. Perhaps they were once human, but no longer. They were pale as seashells, bony and dark-veined. The strained rise and fall of his chest was the only thing moving on Dibahel's otherwise lifeless body. Better than he deserved. Hate was an unusually powerful feeling for the warrior. But he truly hated Dibahel for what he had done to him and his people. To his father. However, he did not have time to squander on Dibahale or his personal vendetta. No, both would have to wait. His purpose had just fled across the top of the mountain, sending her dark priest to forestall her impending doom. For years, the Blood Queen had escaped the warrior and his fellow Pharaoh Mage. As the leader of the Morians, a cruel and perverted tribe who slew and sacrificed others to their fallen goddesses, Myria had caused much death and grief upon the lands of Ethria. The warrior grunted as he lifted the black obsidian dagger from the tattooed man's broken body. Poetic, the warrior thought, as he looked over the long black blade. His eyes then turned northward to where Myria had retreated. To die by the same blade that slew my father. As the lone warrior crested the mountaintop, he spotted the woman draped in a black ceremonial dress. She's beyond beautiful, the warrior thought. Almost as beautiful as the great Alethior, the old gods. It was even said she was half-bound, having the ethereal of the Fallen Ones tethered to her being. Myria's scarlet hair and purple irises were an unusual trait, even amongst her people. The Morians were known for having wild eyes of dark browns and greys, and coarse hair that was black and rough like horses' manes. Moreover, Myria was altogether different from her people. She was both terrible and magnificent, past the thoughts of man's imagination. The Blood Queen stood next to a black stone altar, which had crude runes etched into it. The table was stained with blood, and crystalline sickles of crimson lined its rough edges. The center of the obsidian slab was hewn out, and a black hole sunk into the nothingness beneath it. Myria screamed out a terrible cry that chilled the warrior to the bone. But it did not break his resolve. No. She would not escape him this time. Not if it killed him. He gritted his teeth, the last steps towards her nearly unbearable due to the pain of his injuries. Ordan, strengthen me, the warrior muttered weakly as he stared at his foe. One last time. Your false gods will not save you, Myria hissed in a voice both cruel and intoxicating. Myria struck first, casting a spell of black mist from her hands. He rolled swiftly out of its path, popping up right in front of the Blood Queen. Forcefully, he plunged the dagger towards her stomach as he rose from the snow. Myria's eyes flashed with crimson light, runes forming around her body, deflecting the strike, and knocking the dagger from his hand. Her face strained. She was weak. The warrior reached for the dagger as Miria attempted to flee. He rushed towards her, 
hurling himself against her stone-like flesh. He heaved in pain as they collided and tumbled to the ground. The two fought wildly for a few moments, and then, before Miria could muster another spell, he overpowered her, casting her weary body against the stone table. He took the obsidian knife into his blood-stained hand and cried out, For my father! and plunged it deep into her heart. Everything went dark. <laughs>